Welcome back to Face the Nation. We are joined now by Andriy Kostin, the Prosecutor General of Ukraine. Good morning, and thank you for being here. Good morning. Uh, we just saw our correspondent show some pretty horrific images of what is happening in your country. You keep a database of possible war crimes. You have more than 30,000 documented. How do you begin to sort through them and prioritize? Uh, first of all, at the moment, we have fixed uh, 34,000 war crimes in Ukraine. Uh, when we are talking about prioritization, of course, the cases like we see today and yesterday and days before of war crimes committed in Kharkiv region, including the Izum, of course, such cases are our priority. Nevertheless, we have a lot of cases which are still ongoing, which started in places like Bucha and Irpin. And all of the shelling and destroying of all of civil uh, objects in Ukraine are also fixed and then are also investigated. Mm -hmm. So what we see now is, of course, the uh, horrible amount of potential war crimes committed by Russian aggressor. I would like to say even that what we see now is a system of Russian aggressor, what they do on the occupied territory. And it seems that for me that whenever Russian army comes, they turn this place into new Bucha, as we see in Izum. Your president was on this program in the spring in the wake of Bucha, where it was horrific, the images. He called that genocide. Are you seeing evidence of genocide? Can you bring that case to a court? We have a case on genocide in the office of the prosecutor general, and we are in all the time in communication with International Criminal Court and Prosecutor Han, because the International Criminal Court has also the authority to, uh, to look at the genocide case. So we understand that all of these facts put together will lead us to possible a conviction in crime of genocide. No sitting leader has ever been prosecuted for genocide. Can you actually prove that Vladimir Putin authorized or knew all of what was happening under the command of his military? Of course, it's not an easy way to prove the, this uh, system of command responsibility from the highest level. What we understand at the moment that the crime of aggression is definitely, we know who is responsible mm -hmm. for it. Because the crime of aggression is the mother of all of these crimes, of war crimes, genocide, because without aggression, there will be no other war crimes. And for that reason, for the crime of aggression, the highest politically and military leadership should be prosecuted and should be punished. This past week, the United States sanctioned um, the Presidential Commissioner for Children's Rights, this is an odd title given what she's accused mm -hmm. of, um, who has overseen the taking of children and forcing them into Russia. Your ambassador has put that number at 91,000. There are reports that Secretary Blinken has cited that puts that number at 260,000 children taken from their families. How many of these kids can be returned? And can you prove that this is part of this pattern you're talking about of genocide and intent to destroy? We definitely understand that the kidnapping and forcibly uh, uh, moving of our children, of the future of Ukrainian nation, forcibly, uh, forcibly uh, sent to Russia uh, is, of course, from my point of view, is an element of potential genocide. I will tell you that at the moment we have uh, more than 50 children, only 50, uh, 53, 55 children returned to Ukraine. Some of them now are in, in a safe place in Europe. Mm -hmm. But the number which we uh, in the Office of Prosecutor General have 
is thousands and thousands of children uh, for which we have exact yeah. evidence that they were kidnapped and forcibly sent to Russia. We, we identified now more than 5.5 thousand children who were kidnapped and sent to Russia. Because we, right. in our office, we need to identify definitely. Okay. And, and the United States has now pointed that finger, figure, finger excuse me, right at the Kremlin. I want to ask you about sex crimes and sexual assault and rape. There have been some horrific accounts, women chained in basements, children who are attacked. I don't even want to recite half of what I read yesterday. Um, is rape a deliberate act of subjugation being used by Russia? We saw it in Bucha. We know that these cases were in Kharkiv region, which is now deliberated. We have evidences of, of these cases. The most important is to find out proper evidences and to fix them properly. What, what, yeah. I, did, what I did at the moment now, I created a special unit in the Prosecutor Office General for the sexual violence crimes, and we have a specific team of prosecutors who are well trained for this category of crimes. The, uh, it's important for us to communicate with people and to find out these cases mm -hmm. in order for the victims of these cases to report about them. And for this reason, we also are in close contact with our colleagues in European countries where a lot of people who uh, Ukrainians who uh, fled to Europe, some of them could be victims or witnesses of sexual violence crimes. And we are now communicating, trying to find also these cases. Mm -hmm. Now, in the Office of Prosecutor General, we have now more than 40 ongoing investigations on cases where we definitely know that the crime of sexual violence was committed by Russian aggressors. Sir, thank you for your time today, Mr. Prosecutor General. Thank Good you. Good luck to you. We'll be right back. We turn now to democracy and politics. University of Chicago professor Robert Pape studies political violence. And Professor Pape, good morning to you. Good morning. It's good to have you here in person. Uh, when we spoke back in January about the research you've done at that point, you issued a warning that stuck with us because you talked about the threat of political violence around the midterm elections. We are 50 days away. What are you worried about now? Margaret, we have not just a political threat to our democracy, we have a violent threat to our democracy. It's important to remember that January 6th wasn't just trespassing and going into a federal building. Thousands of individuals use violence to stop the peaceful transfer of presidential power. What we have been tracking at our center at the University of Chicago, the Chicago Project on Security and Threats, for a year and a half is the violent portion of that insurrectionist movement. Today, there are millions of individuals who don't just think the election was stolen in 2020. They support violence to restore Donald Trump to the White House. In fact, just over the weekend, that is just a few days ago, we conducted our most recent nationally representative survey. Today, there are 13 million individuals the equivalent, I should say, of 13 million individuals who support the use of force to restore Donald Trump to the presidency. It's about 5% of the U.S. population. 5%. Have extrapolated out from your research. Um, that's obviously disturbing. Um, I want to ask you about the context we are in right now, because we're seeing a lot of stressors. The economy, clearly one of them, and what we've been talking about today, immigration. Yes. and migration. Um, you were on last time talking about something called the Great Replacement Theory, and that is the belief among some of these insurrectionists that the Democratic Party is trying to replace voters with new people, more obedient voters. How widespread is that conviction, and does what 
is happening now in cities up and down the East Coast trigger this? Um, it likely could, Margaret, reinforce these fears of the great replacement. To be clear, we're focusing on not just support for Trump, but the violent support for Trump mm -hmm. that overrides democracy. And when you look at that, what you see is there are two big drivers among those 13 million individuals. The first driver is this fear of the great replacement, the idea that the Democratic Party is uh, replacing the current electorate, the current white electorate, with more uh, minority voters uh, from the third world. And, and you to hear be the clear, non-U.S. citizens cannot vote in federal elections right. in the midterm races, just to be abundantly clear. That Please is continue. correct. It is a conspiracy theory, but it's not just on fringe social media like Parler, Gab, 4chan, 8chan. This is every day on Fox News. It's on Newsmax. It's on One America. It's on talk radio. So this is driver number one. Driver number two is a belief in the QAnon cult idea, which at first blush sounds a little um, almost laughable that uh, so they would believe a satanic group of pedophiles runs the U.S. government, but we've done focus groups with these folks. And what they really mean by that, Margaret, is that there are politicians that have gotten on the Lolita Express with Jeffrey Epstein and have taken money for foundations, for political support, corruption. for corrupt. That's what's really going on. So if you marry those two together, you have a dangerous cocktail. You have the fear of this great replacement happening um, by a Democratic Party, and then you have the fear of corruption and immorality, and that's that that dangerous combination that's leading to violent support against our democracy. So you just mentioned QAnon, um, and as you just explained, it's a set of conspiracy theories involving sex trafficking, and there is this belief that President, former President Trump is the one person or one of the people who could end it all. And I want to play some video here, because at a political rally last night, uh, Mr. Trump used a song titled after a QAnon slogan. I want to play the sound, and, and listeners will have to listen to the music, not necessarily what the president's saying. Listen to the background music. It would never have happened with me as your commander-in-chief, and for four long years, it didn't happen. And China with Taiwan is next. That is a QAnon song. The former president has posted images of himself wearing a Q on his lapel on social media with the phrase, the storm is coming. That's another one of their slogans. What does all of this mean and is it threatening? Uh, first, it is threatening. Just to cut right to the heart of it, what it means is that the former president is willing to court not just supporters of his, but those who support violence for his goals, number one of which is being restored to the White House. This is extremely disturbing because, well, in the fall of 2020, in a presidential debate, Donald Trump could be asked, well, do you know what a Proud Boy is or do you know what QAnon is? And he could say, oh, I'm not so sure. That's not the case today. Today, it's quite clear, and the problem that we face is that um, over and over in uh, tweets by the former president, he is deliberately stoking not just the fires of anger getting him political support, mm -hmm. but the fires that are leading to that violent 13, the, the equivalent of 13 million. And that is really the heart of our problem that we face as a threat to democracy. Mm -hmm. Because if it's just a political threat, well, then we can have elections. But once it's not just denied an election, but using violence as the response to an election denial. Now we're in a new game, and that's why it's so important we have this conversation. What has the FBI search of the former president's home done to the people you are tracking? So what we've done in our poll, the one that we just recently did over the weekend, is we asked an additional question, which is, do you believe that the use of force is justified to prevent the prosecution of Donald Trump for mishandling classified information? And the numbers go up a bit. Not huge, goes from 13 to 15 million. But interestingly, when we pull apart the data, you get a slightly different set of supporters. 
quarters. Mm -hmm. So what's really concerning is there's a little bit of ebb and flow that goes up as we see new issues come on the horizon. Mm -hmm. And that means that we need to just realize this is really important and we need to have this national conversation about what we really want in our country. And that's why we have you here today to, to start that conversation, sir. Thank you for sharing thank you, your information. We'll be thank back you. in a moment. Thank you. We turn now to CBS News Chief Washington Correspondent Major Garrett and CBS News Election Law Contributor David Becker, who have a new book out on the state of American democracy. It's called The Big Truth, Upholding Democracy in the Age of the Big Lie. Congratulations to you both. Thank you very much. Thank you. You know, Major, I want to start with you because in those, just literally the first page of the book, you use the phrase American Civil War. Mm -hmm. um, you go on to write that in the upcoming election in November and in 2024, trust itself is going to be tested. Democracy no longer suffers from a lack of participatory energy. It suffers from a lack of respect, allegiance, knowledge, humanity, and most of all, trust. How dangerous is the moment that we are in? It feels more dangerous, Margaret, than any I've encountered in covering politics at the national level since 1990. Stating what clearly happened in 2020, it wasn't a fraudulent election, no crime was committed. That doesn't mean you have to be happy with the result, but one of the burdens of democracy is when you're unhappy with the result, your obligation is to win the next election. Not slander baselessly the election you fairly lost. Mm -hmm. And we have a component of American politics now that wants to slander an election that was fairly lost because they're unhappy. And that unhappiness does not entitle you to drag down American democracy because if, Margaret, we enter a phase in American life where either political party refuses to accept a fair and verified election simply because it lost, then we will dismantle democracy bit by bit before our very eyes. One of our colleagues here, Nicole Skanga, interviewed Kim Wyman. She is the senior election security lead at uh, part of Homeland Security. She spent 30 years working in elections out in the state of Washington. And in this interview, she clearly is feeling uh, that this threat is, is hitting home. Take a listen. Some of the threats are real, you know, we're going to hang you, I hope somebody puts a bullet in your head, that kind of thing. Um, so it's unnerving. <laughs> it's unnerving. It's a Homeland Security official being moved to tears by what she is talking about. I mean, it, it, it's, it's extremely powerful to me to hear that. How common is that right now? Yeah, unfortunately, it's very common. She, like so many of her colleagues, and she's seeing this because she's working with them, are facing an onslaught of threats and harassment and abuse in the aftermath of the 2020 election that is completely divorced from the reality of their success. The election professionals all over the country, red states, blue states, Republicans, Democrats, somehow managed the highest turnout we have ever seen in American history in the middle of a global pandemic. And the ultimate results of this election were withstood scrutiny from 60 courts around the country. It was remarkable. What's the scenario they fear this November? They embrace aggressive transparency. They want everyone to see everything that they're doing. And yet, despite the facts, despite that transparency, all that seems to matter is that some people believe that it's impossible for their candidate to lose. And if we get so divorced from that reality, we get so divorced from our democratic principles that, as Major said, we start being unwilling to accept the, the possibility of defeat, what might, then, what, what might be possible then? Mm -hmm. And we've already seen this. This isn't hypothetical. We've seen this on January 6th, and we could see in the future dozens of little January 6th, not focused on Washington on one particular date, but focused in many different places on many different dates. And Major, you talk about the um, political benefits to calling 2020 into election, particularly for the former president. According to CBS numbers, in battleground states, over 60 percent of Republican candidates on the ballot are election deniers. Two of the best known, perhaps, Carrie Lake out in Arizona uh, and Doug Mastriano in Pennsylvania. Is this, indulging this, simply the cost of winning an endorsement from the former president, who is a political powerhouse? Mm -hmm. Or do they believe it? It's certainly the former. Getting President, and President Trump's endorsement runs through a sieve that requires you to say the 2020 election was stolen. And if you say it 
the loudest of any of the Republicans also vying for that endorsement in any particular state, you're most likely to get that endorsement. But Carrie Lake's an interesting example of this phenomenon. She said before the primary was decided that fraud was afoot. She said while votes were being counted, fraud was afoot. She was trailing, and then she came out ahead, late in the process, and said it was then, therefore, legitimate. I would only say that is not a veil of hypocrisy. That is the very definition of hypocrisy. The exact process you assailed is the one that made you the GOP nominee. Therefore, it's legitimate only because you become the nominee? That doesn't add up. David, we've talked in the past about um, Democrats who have questioned the outcome of elections. Um, Republicans often point to that when, when this is discussed. Um, how concerned are you now that this kind of language is just becoming not normalized, but made into just a political tool? Yeah, I'm very concerned about that because factually speaking right now, we have the most professional, accurate, transparent, secure election system we've ever had. And it keeps getting better every election cycle. But and, 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 and it's interesting you say that because, as you know, there has been this movement to change voting rights and to protect them. So it is becoming discussed as if there is something perhaps not working right. It's really troubling in the sense that while it's not moral equivalence here, it's not coming equally from both sides of the political spectrum. It is definitely coming overwhelmingly from the extreme right right now. There certainly are aspects of it coming from across the political spectrum. But we could get to a point that if this is seen as politics as usual, that this is just part of the game, we're going to be at a very, very dangerous point for our democracy. If the losing side cannot accept defeat, especially in a country that's divided 50-50. The great fear I have, Margaret, is politics is a lot like the NFL. It's a copycat league. Mm -hmm. Whatever succeeds, you replicate. On the right, in the Trump world now, the fastest way to social media fame and fundraising is to deny the 2020 election. You don't think Democrats aren't watching that and may be tempted by the same social media and fundraising lure mm -hmm. that that has? They will be. That's why we have to stop it, back away from it, and say, not here, not this place. This part of our civic life is sacred. Thank you both uh, for sharing the book with us and your insights. We'll be back in a moment. Thank you for watching. For Face the Nation, I'm Margaret Brennan.